Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign, Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraiser 4. So, are you guys ready for uh, Hellraiser Bloodlines oh, commentary yeah. track? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it all set up here. All right. And as you guys may have noticed, we got Rob coming back uh, to make a commentary track with us hey. for Hellraiser Bloodline. Welcome back, Rob. Uh, thank you, guys. I hope everybody's been doing well out there in the Fifth Dominion. <laughs> yes. Uh, we certainly have. Everybody. Okay, I think a, a safe point would be to start to pause it just before the Dimension logo. That's where the movie starts. Okay. And um, if everybody's ready, we will start I am. in three, two, one, go. Okay. Yeah, we had a little bit of a mix up because I accidentally started watching Hellraiser 3. <laughs> 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 That's what you get. You, oh, there's Pinhead. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And what you, it's funny on the previously when you said that, I'm like, I don't. Maybe I blinked or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just saw that big boo from Pinhead there. Yeah. It, it was a good way to insert his character way in the beginning of the movie and please and scare the audience. I remember watching this movie in the theater in 1996 when I was at the Fantas Porto Fantastic Film Festival in Portugal. And, and and back then, the fans literally clapped when Pinhead came on screen for the first time. Well, and, and also the producers were upset at, at, at an original, or at the early cut of the movie, right? And Because Pinhead wasn't in it for a long time. So now, they, yeah. now this way they can kind of say, oh, well, if that's what you want, we'll put him in before the title screen. Yeah, no. Absolutely. Because <laughs> he showed up only like an hour into the movie or something. There's Adam Scott, if anybody's seen, uh, he's gone on to some really great things. He plays Shots in the film. Oh, uh, yeah. And Pat and Pat Skipper, I actually got to do a little interview with Pat Skipper. That, you well, know, the, uh, the guy who played Jacques was in Parks and Recreation, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. And he was recently in Crumpus, you know, if you've seen oh, that recently. No, uh, really good film. Yeah. I like really it. good. I really recommend Krampus. It was really amazing. Very good movie. Three editors on this movie, and it's terribly edited. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, really uh, Daniel Licht, uh, composer. That, uh, great score. Great score. I have it on CD. Very, very Very lively. Very lively. All of the DP also shot uh, How Was Your Three. And <clears throat> for Peter Atkins. Yes, Peter. Yes, absolutely. Good old Peter. So three oh, editors, what do you think – why do you think that happened? Did they do it in shifts, or did people just quit because this, is, this is movie is terrible, or – Probably because. I think, uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say I think you're right. I think it might have yeah. been just because uh, the the movie post production was a mess. Yeah, yeah. It's horrible. They kept doing all, you know. I think there was like three sets of reshoots after oh. the initial shot shooting was done. Oh no. So here we have the space station Minos in yeah. twenty one twenty seven. Yeah. This is a cool scene. I like I like the opening of the movie. I like the virtual reality thing that he does here. Yeah, it's really cool. And, you know, that's from Pete's Pete's wonderful wonderful script. If uh, you're a fan of the film or the history behind the mm-hmm. Peter Atkins original script for this was much better. It's, it was like a, a linear story told from past, present, and future. And instead, it, and this, you know, when, during the whole craziness of the movie, they changed the structure of the movie. Around. Here is the uh, space shuttle Theseus, uh, which, of course, is the name of the mythical hero that fights the Minotaur yeah. in the labyrinth. So there's a, a kind of a reference there. So, yeah, like you were saying, we, we start off in the future segment according to the original intended directorial vision of Kevin Yeager. That was supposed to start like this, I think. No, I think it was, he, he, wanted, he started it in the past and went to the present and then the future. Okay, yeah, he was going to follow the the story of a family, right? Was, yeah. Peter was going to start with uh, a family in Paris, like the Le Marchand family or something like that. Uh, no, wait, wait, it was supposed to start in London. 
But then they said, why not Paris and why not make it Le Marchand's family? So that's that's how they came up with the idea. What, what do you guys think of this trope that of using the same actor to play different generations of of you know it's of Le Marchand? family members descendants yeah it, it it happens a lot in movies and and i always think you know i don't look like my grandfather so i, I don't mind it doesn't really need to be done well sure i don't mind it i think it's just you know it, it kind of ties the movie together a little bit and well it's a, the it's truth a, is sometimes yeah well sometimes people cut, are similar guess, for the it's a shortcut for the audience because you'll know right away when you oh that's that's the you know that's the the Le Marchand character from this time period now. But you're right. They they do use that in several movies. Uh, this is like one of the most blatant examples of it. So this was uh, three space CGI animation shots. That was the company that made the animation uh, CGI here. Oh, they look pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> no disassemble. <laughs> in Johnny Five. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and here we go. Here's Pinhead. Yeah. Only four and a half minutes in. Now, this is, I think, part of the reshoots in the original version. You don't hear this conversation. You see, actually, in the work crowd, I think they, you see him talking to Pinhead, if I remember correctly. This, this whole idea of getting Pinhead early um, instead of starting in the past, like you said, it, it forces the movie to be a, a, a big kind of telltale flashback, you know, yeah. to tell, cut in a series of chronologically ordered uh, segments. Yeah. And Boy, that guy's originally... not a good actor. Which guy? Yeah. Oh, the, the the guy with the white hair. Oh, yeah. Is it, did he give some cheesy line to pinhead at the end of the movie, something like yeah, that? Yeah, he asked him, what the hell kind of planet are you from? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What amazes me is that this whole segment that we just saw when they relieved uh, Dr. Merchant is going to be repeated as a flashback, like further down in the movie. And I, I totally think it's not necessary. Pat Skipper, uh, like I said, I got to talk to him. He's a really nice guy. Which guy is Pat Skipper? The guy that the plays captain. Carducci. Oh, he's the, is he the captain? Uh, no, the guy that's kind of an a-hole. The guy that gets, well, later on killed by Angelique through the mayor. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, this set was built in a, a location in Los Angeles. I think it was the A1 Globe Pasta Factory. Uh, and originally in the fourth draft of the script, the Minos was supposed to be built out of an asteroid, literally carved into the asteroid. Uh, so here in this movie, it's a fully built structure orbiting Earth. I think it works better um, for the ending. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you're going to be able to see some parts where they're walking down some hallways and there's like these uh, rock slabs on the walls. So that's yeah. kind of like a, a callback to the idea that this was going to be a base inside an asteroid. Right, and now the rock that. on the walls doesn't make any sense because it's a big, uh, it's a big puzzle box shaped space station. Absolutely, yeah. And this is a this is all reshoots here of him going, you know. Uh, you know, tell the story and uh, flashback. Yep, a flashback. I, I, really, I also don't think that he should have this accent. It doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, if he, if this character was in the United States, I mean, if his family was in the United States for like a hundred years, he has an accent. I, I never noticed that he had a different accent than than any of the other ones, uh, the descendants. I guess may, maybe it's because he's from Montreal, you know. Mm. He is, yeah. Yeah. So this is where the the flashback starts, and from now on, it's all a ride with Merchant's voiceover as he reminisces. Yeah. Uh, like you said, this was all reshot stuff. Um, yeah. This is probably this stuff right here. Might, probably is from the original shoot. Uh, yeah. Because originally the opening credits was supposed to play over him making the box or just oh, showing him. Oh, that's cool. I think, think that's what I think it would have been better that way. Yeah. I think so too. This was supposed to open the movie in the fourth draft of the film. And here it's an interesting uh, here's an interesting tidbit. The uh, unfilmed Hellraiser 3 script by Peter Atkins featuring Pinhead running a demonic bordello 
called the Fever House also began with the uh, drilling sequence with a chilling exactly. sequence of of Le Marchand working in close-ups and featuring intricates of his automata as we saw his face and eyes putting the box together and uh, you know and and his decay as he fell into genius and madness yeah it's kind of interesting I think Hellraiser 3 Pinhead doesn't come into the movie until like halfway th- into the movie right or uh, maybe, maybe it's a little sooner than that now this is reshot stuff too this is um He's showing his wife what the box does. And and then her reaction is hilarious. It's like, oh, it doesn't actually do anything. A masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. He's just so disappointed. Yeah, it's... This is the 1800s. We don't have servo motors engines yet. It's like, it's all done with cogs and, and springs. I love the little dolls in the background behind her. That was originally, I, you know, it looks like uh, those old... Uh, Automata? Yeah. And that was uh, originally supposed to be a in the original Peter Atkins script. It's going to have a cool scene. Uh, mm-hmm. we'll talk about that later. So obviously she's, she's pregnant because there's going to be a bloodline um, going down the generations here. Yeah. Also makes the whole, I need to go out at midnight to deliver a box at a mysterious mansion much more risky because, hey, his wife has left home and she's pregnant. So Yeah. Valentina Vargas and Adam Scott, uh, she's she's been dubbed throughout the whole movie. Um, oh, really? Yep. In, yep. The work, in the work front, you actually get to hear her voice, which I wish they would have used her voice because it's so much more seductive sounding. Yeah, maybe they thought the voice didn't have the right accent, but personally, I've heard her the real voice in the uh, alternate cut, and I, I prefer it. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, and this is a great. So, this is a nice, nasty little scene. I think. Uh, so did they just uh, dub her because they th- figured she shouldn't have an accent? Probably. Maybe. So. But I, yeah, I don't see why not. This is a rewrite, rewritten scene uh, by. Ran Revitch, I think. Oh. And here we have this this very chilling sequence where she's going to start seeing the evil, like, shining through the illusion. Look at those nails he has. It's just <laughs> nasty character. He is pretty nasty. That's played by Mickey Cottrell. Yeah. He's a pretty good character. He's a pretty good actor. Um... He played Duke DeLille. Yeah. <clears throat> and we've said this before, DeLille <clears throat> is a lot closer to the Le Marchand character that we know from the comic books. Yeah, yeah that painting, you know, we we see that yeah. they have him. Oh, that one reminds me of this guy. Yeah. And and how immoral and evil he is. Oh, yeah. Just that look in his eyes in that painting, he's, you know, he's not right. He's had a very long career, Mickey Cottrell. And so has Adam Scott. And right now, he's doing a lot of 21 Thunder TV series episodes. Yeah. It's like, oh, no. I'm in the uh, wedding feast table of great expectations. Yeah, so do you guys think that that was supposed to be like the food was like that the whole time and she just didn't see it? Or was it was the spell that now she's seeing all this rot and worms and stuff, but they weren't really there? That's a good question. Uh, you know, he was obviously using some kind of mental block yeah. on her. I'd say maybe, yeah, maybe so. Maybe it really all was, you know, nasty looking food. That's yeah, good. like an illusion thing that he was yeah. putting her under a spell where she saw what she wanted to see. Yeah, but then why would they have all this rotten food with worms in it? I mean, they wouldn't want mm-hmm. to eat that. <clears throat> this was a scene, this scene that we just saw, was a scene that opened up the work print that uh, some people have around there in, in the in the Internet. It's funny to say that um, none of this was in the script until very late into production. Like you said, this must have been rewritten by <clears throat> Rand Ravitch. Because this in the original Peter script, there's like a whole, so he goes actually goes inside the house where he meets Angelique. He's already, I guess... 
a demon, been risen as a demon, and we come to that car player scene. Yes, yes. That's, she's yeah. the Princess Angelique. He's, she's introduced uh, by uh, Duke de Lille. It says, oh, this is the Princess Angelique. Yeah. So we never really see her getting summoned um, for the first time, at least. So because what, he, what he's reacting to here is the card scene, right? That original shoot. That's what he's saying. And then, you know, they reshot all this new stuff, and that's how they edit it together to make it, you know. Yeah, I think those those shots of Le Marchand looking through the window was yeah he would be looking into the card card player scene where they're yeah. playing cards and Angelique is taking a piece of clothing off <clears throat> when she gives him the box and she says every successful turn of the puzzle I will respond in kind. This is a good scene though I think you know it definitely gets under the skin pun intended. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of the shots of the, the skin hanging are later additions to special effects uh, stuff. But I, I, I like it because it shows us that before the box existed, there were still ways to access hell yeah. uh, through spells and magic and, you know, yeah. summonings. The, the thing that I don't like is this idea that, you know, hell from the 16th century was like more typical, you know, uh, like – demons and the devil and stuff like that and pentagrams and then it's like but the modern era hell is the one with the cenobites and the leviathan and i don't know it just <clears throat> i'd kind of rather see think that it was you know the same over you know thousands of years originally uh the hell that we were going to show in the past it was more humorous very kind of like clowns. So like I was talking about earlier, was a scene yeah. that Peter Atkins wrote that of a character named Augustus who's in this movie. He just has a one scene, but uh, there was this wonderful scene Peter wrote where like uh, the Angelique uh, turns into a, a bird and uh, watches and as these uh, mm. this clown troop and comes out and uh, kills Augustus. But it was a very it was like they were like her Cenobites. They were you know, uh, her version Cenobites for that period. For clown Cenobites, yes. Before it became more ordered, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, Leviathan. And obviously, I don't think So, so do, do we know what he's saying in Latin? Yeah, it's kind of gibberish. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like uh, something about a small boat and then, you know, uh, th- th- someone, someone had come up with that translation on a, a Latin forum. Oh really? Yeah. I'll actually write it up and see what I can find. Um, yeah, spectare navicula suaves means looking sweet boat. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> does does not mean anything really. Uh, sounds cool. Yeah. What's that? Uh, yep, and then he says. You know, spectare means to look at. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So if you if you look it up, yeah. Look at my sweet boat. <laughs> look at my sweet boat. And, and spectare ordeum suaves means to watch sweet barley. <laughs> I'll never be able to watch that scene again now. <laughs> we'll have to email Peter about it and say, Peter, yeah. where did you get this, this whole spell thing? Because this is just a bunch of Latin gibberish. Yeah. <laughs> But hey, you know what? Audiences don't know any better, so it doesn't matter. Well, Rob, if you tell him that we're that we, you know, that we did this, and when we post oh, it, yeah. and he'll he'll probably he'll probably listen. Yeah. He said he was scared to listen to the Hellraiser three commentary. Oh, though. really? I don't know if he's done that yet. Yeah. We didn't really harp on that film bad. No, I no. I that line, walk now amongst us, was not in the work print that I saw. So that might have been also a later uh, dub into the movie. Was that, was that an ADR or, would, could, or was he actually saying that like on his face? I can't remember now. I missed it. I just had it here on my notes. I missed it too. So here's the thing. The fact that Delil summons the magic but never sends her back, as was intended in the script... You know, kind of creates a, a part in the movie where it doesn't make any sense because um, he says here, he who summons the magic commands the magic. That's all fine. That's how it works, you know. Uh, yeah. But 
But later we see Jacques with Angelique and they've kind of discarded uh, Duke de Lille. And it's yeah. like, that wouldn't make any sense because he summoned her. He controlled her. So why would Jacques take over controlling uh, Angelique? But so the thing is, there was supposed to be a scene where... Uh, I'm sorry, there's some noise here. Um, there was supposed to be a scene where Duke de Lille would banish Angelique back to hell. And then uh, Jacques would grab the book afterwards by, by himself and summon Angelique back into our world. And that's why he would control her from that point on. Oh, yeah, this is so, this is pretty, so gruesome here with this. This is Augustus, too, that character I was telling you, but he had a much bigger part in uh, the original script than what they shot, I think. Uh, he actually had a different, his death was a little, very unique. He got turned in, they had pictures online. His face got turned in to, like, it was like a, dr like drum. a drum, something like that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I have a good picture of that. So I, I like the casualness of Auguste when he says, well, you created a machine that brings forth demons. Well, just create another machine that sends them back. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know. It's, yeah. But he's not a wizard. He can't, like, yeah. place the spell in the box. Well, but, he, uh, he doesn't really believe him anyway. He's just humoring him. Yeah, but he does get go to work, and he does find a way, so... Now, here's the part that I was talking about, where we see that Jacques is now controlling Angelique. Yeah, and you don't understand why they killed Delil. I mean, it makes right. no sense. It's just... Yeah, right, because Angelique wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. I mean, you just figure, oh, so they got mad at him? Yeah, right. So that configuration that uh, Le Marchand was drawing earlier... That, that he leaves behind for his descendants to work upon and improve. It was called the Elysium configuration that would ban the Cenobites with perpetual light. I always wondered why Philip went back to get the box. Um, yeah. I guess he was trying to keep it from, from opening up again and bringing forth more demons. Or maybe it was because he couldn't get his Elysium configuration to, to come together. Or maybe he just wanted to steal it and get rid of it. You know, it would be easier than coming up with the Elysium configuration, right? Yeah, if only he hadn't gone back inside. Yeah, that's true. I guess it adds more tension What makes it a horror movie. Because honestly, it doesn't really matter, right, whether he had died or not. For the story. Yeah. There was supposed to be a scene where, um, like I said, Angelique would uh, <clears throat> try to kill, I think it, uh, Rob, help me out here. Was it, Angelique was going to try to kill uh, Le Marchand or something, yeah. and then Delil would banish so, her? Yeah, he banished her back into the, uh, the he got her into the, the pentagram that was on the floor. That was it, yeah. Yeah, and uh, remember the, the whole... Uh, ball scene they had there was like a whole sequence i mean this, yeah there was supposed to be a ball of, going so on much material in this original 18th century uh, yeah i think the past segment is the one that got cut the most oh yeah yeah because now it's oh. just kind of like it just comes it's over before it really begins I mean, yeah there's no no meat to what you know everything mm. all this stuff and afterwards, here, uh, after the sequence, we were supposed to see Genevieve, uh, Le Marchand's wife. She was supposed to be shown boarding a boat to America. Yeah, oh. pregnant. And Jacques was originally supposed to, after Angelique gets uh, sent back to hell, he uh, summons her. And that's how she becomes his, I guess, kind of, he just uses her for, you know, pleasure and, you know, kind of like a sex toy. Yeah, and whatever things he wanted to do. And, and keep him young, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, I was, when I watched this earlier, I was thinking it would be, um, it would have been interesting to see a little bit of his, their adventures over the centuries, you know. Jacques and, and, uh, Angelique. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Uh, 
originally he gets killed by being crucified on a oh, wow. wall. Uh, uh, on Marchand. Jeez, that's harsh. Yeah, and um, well, and also if Angelique is really interested later on, you know, in the movie to find out that there's a that there's a, a Le Marchand in America, why did why wasn't she hunting down his heir earlier? Because she couldn't leave Jacques, I guess, and she didn't know where they were. Uh, in the original, in the original script, it does touch on that, Ryan. The question you asked, because uh, Angelique, uh, uh, the wife Genevieve, mm-hmm. you know, mentions that she's pregnant and that you know Angelique wants to kill her. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, that was in the Peter script, and because she didn't want the she didn't want the bloodline to continue. But then she that's when that's when Delil, yeah, that's right. Delil comes in and takes some gets her into the pentagram and sends her back to hell. Oh wow. I, I highly uh, recommend reading that script. It's um I think you can find it. Uh well you know, you guys can maybe post it in the show notes. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. So here's the merchant talent for designer and architecture oozing through Le Marchand's work. Um, this is going to be, of course, now they're not called Le Marchand anymore. They're called Merchant. And uh, I like the way that they connected uh, the ending of Hellraiser 3 with this movie. Yeah. yeah. Where the building, yeah, the building was supposed to be a tie-in from the Hellraiser 3 building that we will see in the, that we see in the end of that. But it's not exactly, the box isn't exactly in the same place where Joey threw it, you know, at the end. Yeah, I know. It's in a pillar in the basement instead of just being in a concrete slab. That's right. Also, the dream scene that he wakes up from was a little different. It did show Angelique holding the heart, but he dreamt about his grandmother or something like that. Yeah, a very she's creepy like, scene, yeah. yeah. She's like Johnny. They're, she's telling Johnny, you're the one they're waiting for or something like that. It was weird. Yeah, and then like she starts floating kid. up, and then we see that her dress is, like, super long, and she's just yeah. floating up and back again, like, Johnny, you're the one, Johnny. That that kind of uh, goes uh, towards what Kim Myers is going to say here about, no, it's your grandma. She put things in your head. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's so much uh, – I don't know. It, it seems like they just, just barely do enough – you know, just to get the story out, and that's it. Like the, these lines about, you know, oh, your grandmother filled your head with that stuff. It's like you just got to keep the story moving along. And I don't, I just, I don't like. I think the the weakest part is this uh, present day stuff. Yeah, a lot of stuff got cut out from it too. Yeah, mm-hmm. not as much as the 18th century, but a ton of kind of like, you know. Also, I mean, Angelique was originally kind of there was like a little love story going on between. Her and John Merchant. Yeah, and just the bloodline. and um, That got lost, too. So back in Paris, Jacques is about to break Hell's rules. Yeah. This is all reshot. Uh, the whole sequence where he, he's going to be uh, attacked by Angelique was all reshot to make his death look better. Originally, he was going to age through all the years that he had been magically spared in oh. a single in a single blow. Like Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. That's right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's actually pictures of the molds they did to uh, to age Jacques' head. Uh, they never, I don't think they ever shot it, but it was going to be done by uh, Kevin Yeager's effects team with some mannequins and a series of um, of um, uh, dissolves, you know, like a series of dissolves. Yeah. Um, so they were going to show one face, and then they were going to dissolve to another older face, and then ultimately, you know, down to the... Almost skeletal part. Uh, so they decided to do the sequence instead. I think the aging uh, might would have been probably better. I do too. It ha- she had him suffering a lot more. He suffered through the process of the aging. And this one he does too. I can't say he doesn't, yeah. but just. Uh, so you won't bruise. Yeah. The, yeah, that's, that's that's interesting. Why would she remember that, right? Because that wasn't her. Yeah, I could see that. She but, hasn't you know, even maybe... been summoned yet. Yeah, that's true. 
It's like it's well, like it's a, it's it, like a memory in, inside of her skin. Just Maybe to quote George Lucas, it's just poetry that it rhymes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, those two lines rhyme with each other. They create like this this reference. So notice that demon like claw that Angelique holds there. It's yeah. just rather demonic, I guess. Even no, though pretty cool, yeah. I like that addition to this reshoot. They didn't because yeah. they didn't show that in the work print. Yeah. We never see any other Cenobites changing their flesh physically like that, though. Yeah. But, um, but you know, hey, it's hell, so anything yeah. goes. Well, and they're they're and they 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 said like she's from a different era, and he calls her princess. Pinhead does. She's she's some kind of princess of hell. She gives him this kiss. And, yeah, and yeah. It seems something. like she she did she really didn't like him and and uh, took it personally the way he treated her over all these years. Because she kills him pretty yep. slowly and painfully. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. She tortures him to death. Um, well, he tried to stand in hell's way, so yeah. that's – he broke the rules, Jacques. Yeah, that's what broke you the get number one rule. When you make decisions when you're drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. He there she is. I like that they put the black uh, contact lenses on her like uh, the other Cenobites do. Yeah. It's yeah, and it's kind of too bad for him. He f- he found out about his mistake after it was too late to do anything about it. I also like the lighting effects here. It reminds me of Blade Runner when you have all those like flashing lights in uh, Tyrell's office. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. At the end when uh, I Roy want, Roy kills him. I want more <laughs> life. The original director of photography got fired on this movie. Uh, I don't know who it was. I've always wanted to know who it was. Oh, really? Maybe something. Yeah, it was. Well, the, like the, the, the lighting. The original. In the, the lighting in the present day stuff in America is not very good. It looks like a TV show. This. The this budget was pretty yeah. low yeah. for the story. I think that the budget came up to about $4 million, which was the same amount spent on the previous sequel, Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth. It seems like they spent all their money early on the past sequences, and and then uh, then they just had to, like this, this is like a warehouse or something, right? Yeah, like a studio or something. Yeah. It, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like any kind of place where you would have a bunch of tables and waiters and stuff. In later editions of this DVD of Bloodline, the twin towers have been have been taken away from the background in the box cover. I oh. I noticed that, yeah, because of you know obviously nine eleven. Yeah. Oh, Here's wow. something that uh, the producer of the movie said. She was Nancy Ray Stone, and she said, I've gotten a lot of gray hairs on this production. There are so many elements involved in making a movie like this. This isn't just a few gooey makeup effects. This is very complicated makeup effects, very complicated visual effects, mechanical effects, period costumes, period sets, future costumes, future sets, and the juggling of three different casts. And she says it was very difficult to schedule the show in the perimeters of the budget because it was like creating three movies at one time. Hmm. Uh, that's, I guess, why they started, you know, cutting parts here and there. Yeah. The scene in the work print of this is even different. He, he tell he, the dialogue's different. It is. It is. Yeah. He makes a, a longer speech, I think. <clears throat> Yeah, the sixth shoot started in August 1994 in Culver City, California. And like you were saying, the trouble began when the director of photography was replaced due to an emergency a few weeks into the shoot with with Jerry Lively. Uh, So, you know, fortunately, he had had experience in Hellraiser 3 and other horror movies. So it kept uh, the troubles of joining the production midstream to a minimum. I was also going to mention the the listeners uh, also if you want to see the clown scene Jose actually did a a version of it on it's on the Facebook page under the video section or didn't you, you have a video that you made the card player segment yes yeah, yeah, yeah I have that good. I like you put some music to it and thanks it turned out nice I'll have to dig it up and see if I have it uploaded somewhere because I think I might have taken it down Clive Barker at the time was shooting his own film, Lord of Illusions, and he was just a few blocks down from the shooting set. And he stopped by at least once a week, and he, Kevin Yeager said he gave him some support. He said, I don't know how he does it, but he comes over here on his day off, and he'll just hang for like half an hour to an hour and encourage me. He's been really good about making sure that the film is true enough to the Hellraiser series, which I want to do also. 
course, Kevin Yeager didn't know that, um, you know, that he wasn't going to direct the movie for a long time. It, it is kind of nice that they that they connected Hellraiser two or three and four together. You know, it, it's a, it's a really it's a really subtle uh, connection between the two movies, but they don't even bother with that anymore. You know, after this mm-hmm. one, there's no connection at all. <clears throat> Now, this guy's called Sharp. Poor Sap. <laughs> Angelique is going to use him to open the gateway to hell. Yeah. I guess she needed someone to use her soul as currency for it. Yeah. It would have been funny if one of the, if, if like a sub centibite said, I thought it was not hands that called us, it was desire. And the Pinhead is like, oh, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> I assume, the- you know, that she doesn't have a soul like the centibite, so she needs a soul to summon them. Oh. Yeah, maybe. Right. She, uh, on- I, I wonder if she if she's not allowed to um, to manipulate the box. There's classic uh, Hellraiser style, uh, you know, the the lights through the wall. Yeah, notice how the walls paint is already kind of distressed, and it's a brand new building here. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> right. That's the I like the way she looks in this, uh, Valentine. I like her costume. Yeah. Kind of very Julia-esque. This is your basic Hellraiser moment here. Yeah. You know, seduction, the resolution, the violent yeah. price to pay for it. Yeah. What's happening? Oh. <laughs> As love- a chatter beast. Oh, I love that dog. I love it. There's a There's a figurine of it. From yeah, the uh, Nika. Right now. Yeah. Great figure. Yeah. Oh, that's harsh. Yeah. Although he it's... wasn't on his throat when he was getting dragged anymore. He was just holding on to it with his hands. Yeah. Yoink. Oh, man. Everybody started clapping when I saw this sequence when I was oh. watching the uh, European premiere of the movie. Yeah. I like the it... way they went back to uh, Pinhead's uh, kind of old school. Uh, I like the design in this one. Absolutely. Part, part three, you know, it kind of looked like a porcupine in a way, with all the how the pins, the nails were kind of like you know the pins were so tight together, you know. Yeah, and when I saw this on the Fantasy Porto Film Festival, Doug Bradley was in the theater with us, so uh, oh, cool. he did a little Q and A afterwards. That was so cool. That's cool. Here, Angelique was supposed to say, "I was expecting my clowns." Oh, really? Yeah. <clears throat> Because what he, his response to it, it, Pinhead says, like, what hell is less humorous? Now it's going back to what was originally shot about the clowns. Mm-hmm. It's cut differently from the work print and, and runs slightly longer um, yeah. here with their dialogue. It's cool. I like listening to in the, work, in the work print. You get to hear Doug's actual voice, you know, talking. It's not been filtered through yet. I like this line. This is not a room. This is a holocaust waiting to awake itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a little confusing because I thought he's been trying to do the Elysium configuration. But it seems like Pinhead thinks it's like a way to permanently open a gateway to hell, right? Yeah, they kind of rechanged that when they were like in the production, because obviously that's just like you said. It was supposed to be the Elysium configuration and showed how the concept was evolving through the decades. Um, yeah, it, but yeah, that was mm, yeah that was supposed to do perpetual light in that building. But yeah, I think Pinhead should have recognized that and would have just wanted to kill him Im- immediately and destroy all that stuff. Yeah, man. Yeah. Just had a lot of props. <laughs> they yeah. did. They did. So and there's the Elysium configuration. I love that uh, drawing. I think she recognizes it here. She sees that yeah. it's. Uh, yeah, she didn't really know what it was at first either. Yeah.
Because there's a scene it's... in the work print where she figures it out after the... Yeah. I think maybe it's... After this scene, there's a quick scene where she's like... She realizes that the... the it's a gateway to open the portal forever. Yeah, now she understands right there what it would do. Yeah. <clears throat> And she uses that, you know, what she knows as a secret against Pinhead. Because originally it was supposed to be this rivalry between them. Yeah. They didn't really like each other. Yeah, so one, uh, one thing that I, I think is kind of a pretty terrible mistake in this movie is that the, the way that Pinhead just sort of dominates her and, and uh, he changes her into a Cenobite and, and uh, it, just, it just seems like pretty anti-feminist, I suppose. Yeah, and she was originally supposed to be a lot stronger character. She spends this whole movie, except for just, you know, these few minutes in this section, uh, being ruled over by men. Yeah. Wasn't Angelique still an attempt by Clive? I mean, Clive has always wanted a kind of a female villainous role. And yeah. the Hellraiser series to be a strong female, because that's what Julia was yeah. supposed to be. So here's a, a great cheesy looking sex scene featuring a revolving bed. It looks like Angelique oh, yeah. is getting inside his head here. Yeah. Yeah. She does a more seductive approach instead of Pinhead's usual. Uh, yeah. You know, chain and hook. Looks like they shot it inside the same place where they shot the uh, summoning I, scene. Al- although oh. I think that Pinhead's uh, Pinhead's kidnapping uh, plan is not very good either. I mean, what's the point of that? Why doesn't he just? Why didn't he just take uh, John Merchant instead? I guess it's more disturbing to see Pinhead holding a child yeah. as a sequence. And, you know, he uses it as bait to call the father and, you know, but he doesn't get need, him to do he, what he wants. He doesn't need to do that. I mean, he can just grab him and hook him and do what you know, and just take him away. Yeah, but now he has a hostage that he knows Merchant cares for, which who's his son, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, he's giving Angelique a hard time for wasting time, you know, and... <laughs> And uh, he should just be more direct and use pain. And at the same time, it's like, well, he could just, I don't know. I think this is a great shot. I love this. I think this touch right here with the pigeon, yeah. don't you think it's probably a Clive touch? Because Clive loves, Clive loves pigeons. Or it's a dove, I think, right? A dove. or Yeah. Oh, okay. Sometimes I say what Pinhead says here to my cat. <laughs> Like, still hungry, ready for something that screams. Oh, oh that's funny. Actually, my cat killed a, a pigeon once. I was pretty surprised about that. Jeez. Really? He just showed up in the back window with a pigeon in his mouth. Yeah, and why does Pinhead get to kill these these security guard people that didn't do They didn't open the box. They didn't do anything. Originally, this was supposed to be just a woman's security guard. Oh, really? Yeah, it was not these two twins. I wish that they didn't use these two twins. They're they're not they're they're not very good actors. This may be Rand Ravitry writes, Rob. Mm. No, I think it was Peter. He wrote it, but he okay. just uh, I believe uh, because originally the twins in the feature site there was in that fourth draft of the Bloodline script that where the twin Cenobites were in there. Right. But right, I think okay. I think when Kevin came on board, he wanted to like. Say, well, why are they just twins? Why were these? I think it was a, one of the connective tissue to, you know. I definitely like the character they're going to become, the the twin Cenobites. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I definitely think that that's an ex- excellent makeup design. Um, that couldn't have been easy to put together, uh, especially for, for the actual uh, actors to play with that makeup, because it, it seems very complicated to walk around with. They couldn't. They- they, you don't have to do. They don't have to incorporate the origin of every single Cenobite into this movie. Yeah, I would have been okay with them just showing up. Yeah, you know. I like this scene a lot right here. See, so gets one of the best pinhead dialogue. 
when he uh, takes out those twins. Yeah. Yeah. We can see the rivalry between Peyton and Angelique take shape here, even though yeah. um, some bits were cut. And uh, isn't there a part we, where you like, uh, like you have a secret, and he takes one of the hooks on his <laughs> finger, and, like yeah. opens it up, tastes her blood, and she doesn't really open up her card game to Pinhead, especially about the Elysium configuration, what she knows about it. Yeah, but that's seems- that's. That's why I think Pinhead resents the fact that she knows stuff she's not saying, and you know she's pursuing a hidden, hidden agenda. But why? Why does Pinhead? Why is Pinhead more powerful than her? If she's supposed to be some sort of hell princess, why does he get to take her and turn her into a Cenobite, and she just has to stand behind him all the time? Well, that's just because the fans knew Pinhead more. <laughs> you know, they love yeah. him more. They want Pinhead to be the main villain. No, I um, yeah, no, I know. I just don't. You know, it doesn't. It, I, I don't like it for the story. I know. What you mean is that it seems like her power is not there anymore. Like she yeah. – maybe the power that these Cenobites yield is connected to their position in hell. Maybe after she left it for so long, maybe she she doesn't have a connection to hell anymore. Yeah. You know? That's just a fan explanation, I guess. Uh, right before the scene, she's looking at herself and she's crying. You know I mean? Was there, was there some kind of – regret on her part of being like a this demon or princess she seems very vulnerable well and then, really. and then later on she has some kind of a power with mirrors right yeah but a hundred and something years in the future i kept thinking they should be playing the um the the rolling stone song under my thumb <laughs> under my yeah, these these are these are kind of comic relief. These two security guards. Yes, uh-huh. and the movie. I don't, they, I don't mind them. They, they it doesn't really work that well. I mean, they, they're not they're not funny, and the rest of this movie doesn't really have jokes in it. I don't know. I thought I thought, I thought it was kind of funny the whole you know joke about the you know would you have sex with a you know a a, a, a man that used to or what was it a woman that used to be a man? He's yeah. like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> they tell me, I thought that was... If she's cutting know, all. Yeah. yeah, I just thought it was funny. But their acting is, you know, what, probably like yeah. B-movie level actors, you know? I mean, they're... Yep, they're not the only twins that uh, were listed in this cast, uh, because when they they have uh, the twin Cenobites, they're not played by these characters, uh, yeah. by these guys. They're played by a different set of actors who are also twins. I would imagine that they would want skinny people to put in those costumes. Yeah. Uh, this is great acting right here. <laughs> Don't make us put some pain on you. Yeah, that line is so contrived just to, so they can get Pinhead to say this line. All right. But yeah, but but a payoff Still, is really good. The payoff yeah. is good. He's got pins in his head. Pinhead totally does not care about the guns. He's just like, eh, it's okay. Yeah. This, this is the first time somebody ever put a gun on Pinhead, right? Hellraiser 3 had the cops. Uh, well, it wasn't towards Pinhead. It was towards the, the proto Cenobites. Right, right. And the, the bullets didn't do anything to them. <clears throat> I, I'd really like to know what our building security guards doing with guns. Yeah, right. I don't think they ever had guns. Uh, they usually have like tasers or something. And why? And it seems a little. Uh, I mean, what's so special about this building that it needs two security guards at night? All this transformation scene that's going to come up was done in a later period of production when they went back to do the reshoots and shoot all new material for the film's death scenes and improve some other scenes. So this transformation was slightly different in the uh, work print. Yeah. It featured a saw and um, <clears throat> some drills, I think. Yeah. They, they never rough. go back to this thing where they have to pump into that, that blue liquid into their blood to, to make them, you know, keep living after they should be dead. Like they did in Hellbound? Yes, yes, yeah. That makes them, like, look a little bluish. Yeah, and and I always kind of figured that that's what made them undead, where they, you know, they should be, they should have died from all this stuff, but they're still alive. 
Yeah, it should be like that blueness that comes from hypoxia yeah. when, uh, you know, a corpse. And there's a little bit of uh, CGI in there. Oh, wait. No, never mind. There it is. I take it yeah. back. I still think uh, Chouinard's, uh, his, uh, when he gets turned into a Cenobite's better. The twins that are going to play the Siamese twin Cenobites, they are Mark and Michael Polish. And and they would also play Siamese twins in a later movie they wrote and directed called Twin Falls, Idaho from 1998. Just two years it's a very ago. strange movie. Yeah, a very strange movie. I think uh, I recommend it. Uh, but they play Siamese twins in that movie, too. They have to be separated, and there's all this anxiety about, are they going to both make it and stuff? A really tight close-up on Pinhead. <clears throat> Here's our Glenn Close look-alike. Yeah, I think, <laughs> man, look at those mom jeans. Yeah, those are really... <laughs> I think that, that, that Merchant's family is pretty weak. You know, I mean, as far as, like, you know, just sort of milk toasty, you know, wishy washy actors, and the kid is terrible. Yeah, that kid, uh, he was in the Shining uh, TV version. I couldn't stand him. Oh, really? Yeah. He, he was uh, He was Danny Torrance? Yes. Was that the Mick Garris? Um, yeah, it was the Mick Garris adaptation. Oh, yeah. But mm-hmm. it just wasn't, uh, it was him, the little kid. Hmm. Like yeah, he's he's the main character for the whole thing. That that's too bad. He didn't really get on my nerves in this because he didn't really talk much. Yeah. I mean, no. There was also uh, some other things that happened during production during principal photography was that uh, they had uh, other kids. Another kid that was gonna play in this movie, he got uh, chicken pox or something. It had to be replaced. Oh wow! I think I remember something like that. He lost his big break. Yeah. This scene right here where she uh, goes to do the laundry was originally supposed to have a bit more uh, effect. It was supposed to be a bit more effects. Yeah, something uh, happened with the uh, washing machine, right? Yeah, something happened with the washing machine, yeah. Oh. I haven't read the, the script in a long time, so I kind of I can't remember exactly what happened. In well, the there were four... They, uh, mm. In the work print, I was just going to say, there's a title card they bring up, like, washing machine goes crazy or something So, like so John that. Merchant <laughs> is, like, some kind of rich millionaire guy, but but her laundry has co- is coin-operated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's also in a basement, but then there's a window that leads to a garden. Yeah. There were four attempts by Kevin Yeager to appease the producers, and, and these four cuts would vary in length between 110 to 82 minutes. Ultimately, Miramax wanted Pinhead in sooner in the movie um, and a happy ending with Merchant escaping and getting the girl. So, you know, Yeager left the project after he found it was hopeless. He said that, uh, according to Kevin Yeager, this ended up being a battle becoming a constant battle between art and the money. I don't believe him and the producer. Oh, uh, man, Pinhead looks so bad in this this lighting. You think? I, I like it. I like it. Yeah. I think it brings out the gold pins a lot. I don't, well, and I don't think that we should be looking down on him from up, up on stairs. And I don't know, it just doesn't look right to me. I, I never liked him in the daylight outside in Hellraiser 3 either. Oh, I agree with you there. I, yeah. Me too, yeah. Didn't. Yeah, yeah. So I, I remember the, uh, the the washing machine would be demonically possessed and there would be light and noises coming coming wow. through the floor. Yeah. Remember that scene in the work print, uh, Jose or Ron? Have y'all both seen it? Yeah. Uh, like, there's a scene where Angelique, uh, you know, they show a brief part of it where she tries to seduce him and she gets upset and starts to scream at him like this evil, you know, nasty scream. Do y'all remember um, that part? I think like so. She yeah. Starts, she starts to turn into like the Cenobite. Hmm. But I need to rewatch that. Yeah, I need to rewatch that. But that sounds familiar. That yeah, sounds familiar. We did an episode of it, but it was quite a while ago now. An episode about the work print. <clears throat> and the Hellraiser post- podcast also did an episode uh, about uh, Hellraiser Bloodline. Oh. Well, they did episodes about all the movies. Yeah. 
Now here's the, the shot of the dog. Did y'all know a, there was actually an actress that played in that suit? Yeah, the dog. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know that. I thought it was an animatronic. Huh. I think for some scenes, yeah, there were um, there were scenes where there was a guy dressed dressed up in it. There's a CGI Cheddar Beast, and other parts of it was just like a kind of a puppet animatronic. I don't understand why that they had a dog's head on. Yeah. The wall. I never heard like that. I was like, that looks like they fine. looks like they might have gotten a lot of stuff from uh, a prop warehouse and just decorated this hallway. Yeah, yeah. kind of you know reminds me of how Hell's taken over the building. And become yeah, the- Hell's presence is corrupting the the building. Yeah, uh, yeah. there's even so, a nice torture pillar that we just saw. Yeah, definitely. That's cool. One of the last times we well, I can't yeah. remember the direct the videos. Did they have the torture pillar in their movies? I don't know. I, maybe not. I think this might have been the last one. <clears throat> so the pinhead makeup in this movie was done by uh, Gary J. Tunnicliffe. And as you can see, it's it's become rather clean and slightly different than the first couple of movies. Yeah. Like the, uh, the intersecting gashes on the head became very, yeah. very, like, subtle. I always like, is his pinhead teeth I never, in the first film, they were yeah. kind of like black, nasty, yeah. black looking, didn't it? It's, more yeah, went along because he, he was corpse like. Yeah, and he had the black eyes. I like this line coming. It's like, what's he say? Uh, he's so got, yeah, this this part like of the kind of this part of the plot is kind of nonsense. That Pinhead thinks that he's going to somehow open this gateway to hell. I mean, yeah, when, when he says you have to complete your work, well, if he completes his work, he's going to destroy the gate forever and kill Pinhead. Because they changed the story when yeah. they were doing the movie, and it yeah. just doesn't make any sense here anymore. Yeah, that's too bad. Did they done realize that when they were editing it? I mean, three editors just work on this. I mean, yeah. they, they need to leave this in here, you know? Yeah. When he says the room downstairs, potentially a bigger pathway. Uh, no. Wrong. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's like, so. so what does this mean? Does this mean... Pinhead doesn't understand what he was looking at. Maybe he wanted him to alter the Elysium configuration somehow. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Because he's got the talent to create, a, a, you know, the, the magic yeah. box or whatever. So. This always seems a little uh, useless. Like yeah. this part where he says, run, Jack, run. And it's yeah. like, well, you guys are being chased by a demon. And you're in a hallway that's obviously demonically corrupt. So yeah. it's the whole building's turning into hell too. So yeah, there's really no place you guys can run to. Yeah. And oh. Pinhead's like, oh, okay, I guess we're doing this. Well, and that door looked like they were supposed to have gone into a room, but ne- but they went into a hallway instead. It's like they, why would there be a door from one hallway to another hallway? <laughs> yeah. Well, that hallway is not on the charts. Oh, I see. Remember? Remember when yeah. the, the, the... Yeah. And here you can see in this hallway that there's no ceiling to this hallway. It's just weird. It's uh, yeah. seems like something that someone just put together inside a warehouse to shoot this scene. It's an interesting hallway design, but it just yeah, doesn't yeah. seem real. It seems like the 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 background of something, like yeah, behind the scenes It, it almost something. looks like it's reused from the space station. Yeah. This is a great dialogue scene, though. I really like it. I think it's just... This movie also introduced a lot of different powers to Pinhead, like the the one he's going to show here, where he can mimic someone else's voice. He's the predator. Right. right. Yeah, he's the predator. Or the T-1000. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a pretty ambitious plan here for Pinhead. Yeah. But then I think it would kind of uh, make the whole idea of hell useless. If if hell could just, like, take over the world, then, you know, yeah. pretty soon there wouldn't be any world to, to torture because everybody would be um, in hell. It's like the the plot for Blade where they have the blood god and he's supposed to come and turn everybody into a vampire. So yeah, like, and then, okay, well, then who's left to eat? You got to drink, yeah. Well, blood, you get to drink. Yeah. 
dog stuff uh right here they cut out i don't know i thought it looked pretty good you see the dog yeah. jump through the door too yeah uh it's it's like a combination of like alien 3 and uh and like ghostbusters yeah and it's, oh i see yeah i, I can see that now it's just so choppy it is a little choppy, yes. But I like the idea that, that somehow the design of the Chatterer is present in most of the Hellraiser movies yeah. in one form or another. Yeah. Although the most ridiculous one is Torso in Hellraiser 5. Yeah. This one's pretty badass. Um, I, although it's kind he'll of... He'll be back up in the new one, won't he? It's, Chatter, it's a little bit new. ruined by this, this scene here because how would she know that that would do anything? You know, like... She pushes some buttons and turns the box and points it at the dog. Why does she think that's going to do anything? Well, Kirsty kind of does the same at the ending of Hellraiser 1. Yeah. Yeah, well, she's had some time with it, too. Sure, that's 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 a good point in the hospital room. Um, what were you going to say, uh, Rob? Uh, nothing, I don't think so. Don't okay. Care. Thank you. We were talking about the Cheddar Beast. I was just going to talk about how the Chatter Beasts and just there were there was going to be more in the more shots of it in that scene before it gets sent sent back to hell. Mm -hmm. Now this was this, originally this. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's just a great shot, and I think yeah. Doug Bradley signed a bunch of pictures taken from that still. This scene was different because it shows how Angelique originally was trying to destroy Pinhead. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, there was a scene where he fly, he, a hook comes out of his mouth, and he flies up to the yeah. ceiling. Do well, here we are, this, the end of the movie. Yeah, um, like Rob was saying, there's a scene where he was supposed to escape from the, the lasers. Uh, obviously, here they're just like flashlights, but uh, there were going to be lasers. And he would just fire a chain from his mouth and climb up to the ceiling like a spider. And you can still find stills that have them like hanging from the ceiling and um I, I definitely can add that to the show notes um and here another thing is uh that hook has some saws and they cut through his neck but not his fingers right and that scene uh is so badly edited <laughs> from, yeah. what work, from what the work print shows it just played out so much better and 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 pinhead laughing kind of seems a little out of character yeah he just took the box away from her, right? I mean, I, yes. he's never been able to do that before. See this shot with her being dragged on the floor? That happened earlier in the scene. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, Jose, you sent me, like, this, I don't know, like, this clip of, like, like I don't know, it was, like, a camera shot or effect shot of something going through Pinhead before this particular yes. shot. Where you, it was, like, it's like it was a through, test. Like, oh, it was a test. That's all it was. It was a test footage, um, and I think that's been around for a long time, almost oh, yeah. as long as this movie. Uh, it, I got it from the Hellbound web, and it was this video where you see that scene where Pinhead is yelling out and looking up in the middle of the, 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 the lasers and stuff. Then the camera would like kind of zoom into his head and go through the, uh, the gashes and the pins, and it would just like – go like that and then you'd see pinhead's face glow from the inside and explode and um yeah i don't know i mean i think that might have been from the cgi company that was doing this maybe there was a, a special effects test but i don't think i've ever found it anywhere else so that's the only clip that exists uh, to yeah. my knowledge we've discussed this jose we don't like how it goes back it shows us again yeah, it's, I just yeah, don't like that. I mean, you don't need to. Because if you, audiences it, remember, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Stupid. We were talking about that in the plague, right? What that they did this, they did that with um, having flashbacks to stuff that already that happened in the movie that we already saw. Yeah, a few minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Pinhead again. Yeah. And then we're gonna see the Theseus crew, you know, coming up and saying, you're relieved, and then... Yeah. 
No, Angel Lake looks great. That's a great, I have to admit, that's a really good, I've always held that design. Yep, inspired by Whoopi Goldberg and Sister Act. Yeah. That's what, uh. Wow. Because it looks kind of like a nun outfit, at least yeah. the, the the head part. Um, it's kind of hard to see it, but, you know, the veil. I always wondered why he thinks that that big vault thing is going to keep the Cenobites inside. Yeah. Well, it did for some reason, right? They had to trick somebody into opening the door. Well, we kind of forgive that because, um, you know, the, the, when you read the script, there was a really gold golden gem in this. But uh, unfortunately, there was just not the budget or the... Or the director's talent to bring that to life. I mean, would... remember, in the, remember in the work print, there was a few scenes that were shown where, like, yeah, originally he doesn't he cut his head off? Not cut his head off, but uh, cut his hair off. He had long hair originally, and then he cut That's it off. Right. And then he then he talked That's to right. some like hologramic, a hologramic like priest. Priest, yeah. Yes, there was something. a scene. Uh, that might have been written by Rand Ravitch uh, and Joe Chappelle, who did the reshoots. Um, so there is a scene where uh, Merchant is preparing to summon Pinhead, and he feels like this is the end game. And so what he does is he has long hair, and then you see a, a sequence of him shaving his head. And then he confesses his sins to a holographic priest, and then, um, you know, he he asks for for strength to do what he must do, and uh, and that's why his head is shaved. Yep, uh, Pinhead uh, Peter Atkins in an interview to the Lost Souls newsletter in 1996 about the delay of Hellraiser Bloodline release uh, reported the following. He said they needed to do more shooting. They liked a lot of what they saw, but some of it they didn't. Plus, they wanted more. So they brought Doug back and a few of the other cast members and did what they call an enhancement shoot in early April of 1995. Mm. Since then, they've been back and re-edited. Now they're about to do another six days of shooting to improve Pinhead's death. The movie will finally be released in March 1996. So basically, the reason they were spending the extra money in having this extra shoot was just they wanted to keep the franchise alive for part five, part five and six. Oh. So at one point, nobody really cared about this movie anymore. Yeah, that's really a Ex shame. Yeah, it yeah. really is. <laughs> they, were, they just didn't want to lose the franchise, and that's why they just finished it and kind of wrapped it up. It's sort of a um, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? I mean, that's this movie... This movie is not good because people didn't care about it, and it's not not the other way around. Yeah, like uh, interviewed by Dave Hughes, Doug Bradley commented on the post production. He said it was horrible. Everything about it was dark and impenetrable. There were a number of fundamentally bad decisions made very early on, primarily to do with trying to shoot Bloodline for the same money and in the same time frame as Hell on Earth. But not only did they want it shot in L.A., which is expensive, instead of North Carolina, which isn't. It was clear that this was far away the most far and away the most complicated Hellraiser script, certainly more so than Hell on Earth. And like Hellbound was obviously going to be relatively effects heavy. So even before we started filming, I had some serious doubts whether the movie could be shot in thirty six days on the money we'd been given. The irony, of course, is that they ended up spending the extra money <laughs> they were refusing to commit in the first place. Yeah. Uh before uh it's that even... character Parker in the original, uh, his death was different. He got killed by the Chatter Beast. Oh, and they reshot his death to make it a little bit better, which I think is was the right thing to do. I like the reshoot, reshot better. Mm -hmm. I think that Except... they, they shouldn't have Ex had the same Cenobites for the, for the last like hundred years. I, you, you would think that over that time he could have picked up some new ones. Well, he did. This Did is... Siamese twins, Chatter Beast, and Angelique? That's They're... what I'm saying. Those are all those are all characters that we saw in the present day. Oh, I see what yeah. you mean. Right. So yeah, like 120 years in the future. Yeah, and but he hasn't picked up any new Cenobites since then. Or 110 years. Yep. So um, 
And then Doug Bradley did two weeks of reshoots. So he says they weren't really reshoots at all. They were shooting whole new material. And there were at least two other sessions which didn't involve me. So like you said, Rob, earlier in the commentary, there were like four four different reshoots. Yeah. I mean, there's no telling how much deleted footage. I'm sure all that footage that got deleted in the 18th century is out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope so. They can, you know, if the surgeon scene can be found... <laughs> I'm not, I know for a fact that this has got to be out there somewhere. Such an amazing makeup for Angelique there. And you see back there behind that guy, the wall is made out of rock. There we yeah, go. That's why. Yeah. 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 Now it's just, like you said, it doesn't make any sense. It just, yeah. It's like a weird design choice by, you know, I guess him. He wanted that rock there because he just like, I don't know. Another, another quote from Doug Bradley is, I couldn't have told you the story if I tried as they were dicking around with the script so much and probably had a sixth or a seventh of a movie. So he rescued something from that. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he never mints his words about Hellraiser movies. No. And uh, after watching the final cut to be released, Kevin Yeager took his name off the film. He said, there was a lot of me in there, but there were a number of things in there that I wasn't involved in. That's why I removed my name. And that's finally how the pseudonym of Alan Smithy took over what was to be Hellraiser Bloodline. You know, it's, it's a movie that was butchered by a series of unfortunate decisions. You know, a first-time director, Kevin Yeager, whose first cut wasn't actually all that scary to begin with. Unsympathetic producers who didn't really understand what the film was about, uh, not enough time or money, or dialogue with the filmmakers. And, and a last-minute team that patched up the incomplete film. Uh, Rand Ravitch, writer, and uh, Joe Chappelle. And with some very uninspired rewrites and, and a confusing edit. Angelique is wearing the same clothes that she wore 120 years ago. <laughs> yeah. That no, saves no. a lot of production money. Yeah. yeah. That's a pretty cool scene, though. I like it. You got to see, is she in, like, the... Uh, what you call it? Uh, Leviathan. The... Yeah. The... I can't remember the name of it. This Leviathan, the story of Hellraiser and Hell and Hellbound Hellraiser. No, I'm no the uh, what do you call it the labyrinth. She's the, that's oh, the part, labyrinth. That's the part of the labyrinth. Yeah. Okay. Here's that scene you guys love so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Favorite part of the movie. They have yeah. laser guns. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How come we only see them use laser guns once? Yeah. There should have been a lot more. That guy should be running around thinking. Damn, this space station is, 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 is nasty. It's like, look yeah, at that. Uh, yeah. Well, and the space station can't be that huge. You'd think he would, instead of hiding right there, that he would try to get back to the rest of the group. Also, I get the idea that uh, they mentioned something about this, this space station being completed and then taken out of orbit. So this is a brand new space station. Yeah. Or supposed to be. And, and that, that music there sounded like Alien for a minute. Oh, here's Pin. Oh. Oh, is he here? Oh, no, I'm just going to keep on walking by. Oh. <laughs> kind of makes Pinhead look foolish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you I know, guess Pinhead side glances. Kind of so a silly it, slasher yeah. moment, too. It just, yeah. You know, it makes it, these chasings are kind of slasher. It turns them into slashers. Yeah. Peekaboo. <laughs> you can totally tell that those um, laser bars are supposed to be... That's they're what just, they're supposed to be, but they're, they're just, just like, like flashlights with smoke or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you kind of forgive that, yeah, because you know. Hey guys, I got to step back up to the bathroom real fast. All right. Okay. All right. That's what let you know. So it's like, uh, oh, uh, the good shots of the space station. I really like the the whole idea of the space station. Yeah. A folding on itself at the end. That's one um, of the coolest parts of this movie. Mm -hmm. And you can also see that uh, merchant here, the future merchant. His outfit kind of reminds us of like a, almost like a priestly outfit and almost like the same kind of jacket that uh, the new pinhead makeup had on at Monster Palooza. Well, obviously, he doesn't know how to use the box here, but. Uh... 
This this part always reminds me of when Christie says it's just a puzzle box, and yeah. then the other guy says, "No, it's a means to summon us." And why why would a um, why would a priestess or like a, a princess of hell say thank God? Hmm. She's being ironic. Yeah. Well, we never really get a lot of uh, confirmation or denial. Whether or not there's angels and, and God in this uh, Hellraiser universe. That's true. That's, al- that's always been an interesting question. Yeah. This, th- I, this is the dumbest kill. I hate that. And they were supposed to say something. They were supposed to alternate each line, and they were supposed to say, I cannot bear to be away from my brother. Uh-huh. And then they would just absorb him, and uh, he would disappear. <laughs> I think it's funny that... Uh, his earpiece falls. Um, this countdown, it seems like a little bit of a cheat, right? Because it, earlier it said there was 12 minutes left, but it seemed like a lot more time had gone by than just the six or whatever minutes since then. Yeah, and countdowns like this, I mean, this countdown makes sense because it's a countdown to a uh, to something that's going to change in the station. But, you know, usually countdowns in movies especially countdowns towards an explosion have always been like this tropey thing where it's like yeah. the reactor is about to blow. There's only 20 seconds until it explodes and there's a countdown thing. Yeah, like and you always wonder know. like, how would they know? <laughs> right. The yeah. meltdown is going to happen when it happens. It, there's nothing that says it's going to happen on, on, on the count to zero. Yeah. Right. I so, mean, it could be a, maybe a, a, an estimation, but they would never really. Yeah. Know. I mean, in this case it's appropriate because it's a countdown towards, um, a change in the station, you know, it's not, yeah. yeah. That is very true. I wonder if that was supposed to just be a screen or a window, because it looks like a screen. It does look like a screen. And there's some more cave walls in there. Yep. More rock slab walls. Yeah. Okay. What have we got here in terms of quotes from Clyde Barker about this movie? Um, well, here, here's one. Clyde Barker saying, uh, in 1995, right now it's out of my hands and it never was really in them. I always say, I always said they never finished shooting the movie. That schedule never really allowed Kevin to film what he had to, and it's my belief that there is much work shooting-wise that still needs to be done. Yeah. He was very right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm When I saw him at the Thief of Always screening, um, or the Thief of Always book signing and Q&A, he had talked about this, you know, kind of hopefully because it hadn't come out yet. He's like, yeah, we're trying something new with this one um that's really interesting so i think they were still in the planning stages for it we have, okay here's like 92 here's a sequence uh she closes one door opens another and then <clears throat> she says here doggy and the, the work print works but this one is messed up in the editing because you see she she closed the door, and then she opened another one, and then she closed it. And then all of a sudden, the Chatter Beast is inside the chamber. But we didn't see it go oh, in. the chamber, yeah. yeah. Right? But in the, work, in the work print, there was like a title card to Chatter Beast enters. Yeah. It's going to be a digital effect. And I guess it just said, screw it. It's like when you're doing an equation, and you're closing all the parentheses, but then you forgot to close one of the yeah. parentheses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the formula doesn't work. Yeah. It's kind of the same here. There was a little mistake there, continuity error. Uh, yeah, that comes uh, towards the thing you were saying earlier, that everybody, uh, every single descendant is played by the same actor. Yeah. You can tell the differences in, uh, the difference in his performance, uh, Bruce Ramsey. It's really clunky, his performance in the, uh the way throughout the reshoots. You can tell he even stopped caring, I think. Yeah. About, you know, the character. Because I think in the original shoot, he really enjoyed, you know, uh, the, uh, the direction. <laughs> right. the there, That's so silly. That famous scene where he <laughs> gets, he's based, gets fooled by, like, a, by a... A hologram. Yeah, yeah I know. 
He's like, I, I, I'm not, I'm not used to technology. What is the internet? Yeah. All done with mirrors. Good sequence here. I like this this transformation sequence, yeah. and uh, I think it still holds up pretty well in terms of CGI. I was noticing Pinhead's teeth were actually kind of nasty in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they remembered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, this was not how it was meant to go down, and the work print has a very different ending where... Uh, you actually see uh, Angelique and the twins. And, mm -hmm. and, and, um, half the zone. and Merchant actually faces off with Pinhead, and they both die together. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good point. Where are the? Why aren't we seeing the rest of the Cenobites getting killed too? You see them like shaking around here for like a brief moment, I think. Oh wait, no, I'm thinking about the work print. Work That's print, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, I mean, we know Chatterbeast exploded, which is a little bit of a cheat. Um, not when I was. I saw this in the theater. I was like, where are they? Yeah. I just, you know, I was just really confused. Yeah, it's almost like, well, they're not as important as Pinhead, so we don't have money to deal with that. Let's just skip it. I've heard that this last line, welcome to oblivion, amen, that was, it was kind of uh, that Clyde Barker came up with it. I don't know how true that is. Hmm. What was the interview? We interviewed Peter, and he said the Clyde Barker line was, I'm so exquisitely empty. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that one, too. And the amen line was a uh, might have been... Uh, uh, ad lib by uh, Doug. Oh wow, that's a good ad lib right there. Yeah, and that now, I, that that was such a quick, just... a, a quick cut to the credits. Like, holy crap! I know. Give us something. And yeah, the movie's over. <laughs> yeah, I know. Get out. Originally, you were supposed to see uh, some tumbling pins in space after it explodes. Been better than anything. I mean, it's you know, it's like having the usher grab you by the shoulders and like push you out of the theater. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's very abrupt. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was, Jose, what's the other ending that Peter wrote in his script where it kind of does a time loop? The other ending was supposed to be uh, after the Mino space station uh, folds into the box, there would be this giant hand that would show up from space and pick it up, and then it would kind of dissolve into uh, Le Marchand's work table, and the hand would put the box down, and you would listen to, ha-ha, I'm done, mm -hmm. and then, you know, his wife would run into the, the room and say, is it is it ready? Is it finished? So that's how it was supposed to be, I think. Yeah, that's, that yeah. would be kind of neat. It was yeah. kind of just recalling Hellraiser. Remember how Hellraiser kind of did that? Yes. It's like amazing. they zoom out from Kirsty and then it zooms back into the box and there's the bazaar again. It's amazing that a movie with the, the scope and ambition of this having three different stories, it's like only an hour and 20 minutes when we get to the end credits. Oh, I know. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, over the years I've had a love and hate relationship with this movie. At the end of the day, I do enjoy it. But I'm not gonna make excuses for its flaws. And what's with this music now? It's like action movie music. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, sometimes they put the, some some different music in the credits. Uh, for example, in the, there's a work print for Hellraiser three. Yeah, when you that, credit, that's fun, yeah, the credits were supposed to be Ozzy Osbourne's Hellraiser, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, so this is this is a, a very troubled movie, but uh, I think it's you know uh, I still liked it. I still saw it in the theater, and that was the last movie of the last Hellraiser movie I ever saw in a theater. And uh, it actually saying? made some money. I mean, it cost I think the budget was final budget was around nine million. Yeah, it made about sixteen for that time. I guess that's pretty good. Jose, were you saying it. that in Hellraiser 3 they were supposed to use the Ozzy Osbourne version of Hellraiser instead of the... In, in a work Motorhead? print. In a work print that I saw at the end credits, they put the Ozzy Osbourne version. Oh, all So right. I guess they were still uh, negotiating or something to make the Motorhead version uh, in the, the end credits. So you saw their uh, robot hands by 3Space CGI... Huh. And assistant to Mr. Yeager, even though he's not the director of this movie anymore. <laughs> right. 
and teachers who probably gave classes to the kids that were uh, oh. playing, uh, you know, Merchant's Kid. So uh, this is it. This is a very troubled movie, but a movie that I still like. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of scenes in this, in the moments in this movie that I really, really think are, are brilliant it's in strong. terms of, yeah. yeah, just strong moments with Pinhead. Uh, obviously, Peter Atkins' writing is is brilliant. I mean, if you can get a copy of the script, just read it because it's a, the movie is there. The movie that was supposed to be is there, and he he in interview he said, um, you know, that he wrote I think six drafts or something like that. Yes. Wow. Right. Yeah. Um, the fourth so, draft is the one that's out there. If you that is correct. It. Yeah. I'd like he that. says, I, I'd written six versions of the script, six drafts, and Miramax always knew that the 18th century came first, and Pinhead didn't appear until the 20th century story. So it's not that anyone could blame Kevin for delaying Pinhead's entrance, because that's the way it was written. That's the way it was approved by Miramax. But I think that when they saw the movie, they suddenly felt, hey, wait a minute, where's our monster? Yeah. We made a terrible mistake. They didn't finger point. They didn't say, oh, it's Peter's fault or Kevin's fault. They just figured, we should have known this originally. We should have brought Pinhead in earlier. And, you know, that's when they started actually pushing to uh, to make the movie uh, have Pinhead in earlier. And that's why we see the future segment opening the movie. So, Well, I think, you know, they should have... It. I mean, I guess you just don't, in hindsight, it's 2020, you don't know how things are going to turn out, but really, if they wanted Pinhead in the movie sooner, they should have figured out a way to, you know, work the script before shooting started and, you know, to fix the problems. Absolutely. Instead of just, you know, going in Still, there, not sure. It's too bad and, because this, this uh, what happened to this movie ended up uh, changing the course of Hellraiser movie for forever after that, right? I mean, they never even were good enough for for a theatrical release. Yeah, after this, everything went straight to video. Yeah. Straight to hell. Yeah. So, thanks for joining us for this commentary track for Hellraiser Bloodline, guys. Yeah, yeah really... I really had a good time doing it, coming back and talking with y'all again. Is, yeah. Uh, always great. Yeah, we thought we, we would have done the Hellraiser uh, Judgment by now, but nobody knows what's going on with that movie. Or I'm just curious, yeah, yeah, since I don't get on Facebook much, what's going on? I was going to ask you what's going on with that. There's uh, no trailer. There's no, I mean, there's there's nothing. It's, I mean, nobody's made any announcements about the release of it. The only one talking about it is Paul T. Taylor, just saying he's excited about it. But Yeah, there was a recent interview with him, uh, I think on Bloody Disgusting, where they talk about his career as an actor and how he overcame hepatitis C, apparently. They talk about that a lot. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Gary Tunnicliffe did, like, a three-hour podcast on, on uh, some podcast called, like, 60 Minutes With. And uh, yeah. he, t he talked all about the movie, and, and uh, he said, you know, he, he liked it, but he said they kept on changing the script. The Gary uh, Weinstein kept changing the script, and... He said, "There's going to be parts that people don't like, and I and I know it, and it's not my fault. Because if you looked at the original script, what you know, your people are going to say that should be there, and it was there, and so he's already started like saying, I know. That the, yeah, yeah, no. yeah, that the internet. That's not good. That's not good. That's not a good sign, man. Yeah. What, yeah. what you just told me speaks volumes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's I he's mean, already, absolutely. He's already distancing himself from it. Wow. I guess we'll we'll see when it comes that's, out. Yeah." And just as a closing thing, I did a music video for Bloodline once, and I think that uh, Peter Atkins saw it, and I think he t he said to he me that you did a better right, job, you did a better job with the <laughs> yeah editing the movie than you know than like what they did than the three editors. So uh, I don't know. Do you, is that still up on like uh, YouTube? Yeah, it's on Vimeo. I just added it to oh, the show notes so oh, you can okay. put it in. Okay. okay. Awesome. All right, guys, thanks for this, and thanks for spending some time watching uh, Hellraiser Bloodline with us. Yeah. Take care, guys. Yeah, take care. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. 
subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fansite and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.